Future Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. We used to have these hangouts. I, a bunch of us would get together and just talk about stuff, and I was, I couldn't believe all the stuff I didn't know. So that means it's very important to have community. Other composers, right. filmmakers, musicians. When, when you have that community, when if you run into some difficult issues technologically, you know you have somebody to call that can walk you through it or give you an idea. Or, it's a yes. real collaborative career path, and I, I always uh, try to advise young upcoming composers to keep developing that sense of community. And you know, it's it's like we really can support and nurture each other. It's not really. I mean, it, there are people that approach it in a competitive way, and we do compete for similar jobs, but right. we also are a community that really helps each other. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. I want to say a quick thank you to my guest on last week's episode, educator artist John Shaw. If you didn't get to hear it, you can listen to all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it, or download our app and take us with you. Also, be sure to tune in next week for my conversation with film director, producer Danny Gold. I'd like to take a moment to also thank the companies that help me sound my best, whether I'm performing live or in the studio recording and producing music. Blue Microphones, Taylor Guitars, Duesenberg Guitars, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Mesa Boogie Amps, Diderio Strings and Planet Waves, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, and Exotic Effects. So often, I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show, to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat, as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is film composer Miriam Cutler. Emmy-nominated composer Miriam Cutler has an extensive background scoring for independent film and TV projects. She is a TV Academy Executive Branch member and Motion Picture Academy Documentary Branch member. Her passion for documentary film has led to an inspired career as a composer, writing music for Oscar-nominated King Sport and Poster Girl, Emmy winners Ghost of Abu Ghraib and One Last Hug, Emmy-nominated The Hunting Ground, Ethel, Thin, and Desert of Forbidden Art, BAFTA-nominated Lost in La Mancha, Sundance winners, American Promise, Scout's Honor, and License to Kill, and Peabody Award winning, The Castro. Her enthusiasm for documentaries has led her to becoming part of the production team. Miriam co-produced and scored the documentary One Lucky Elephant on the OWN Network, and now is embarking on her second project as a co-producer of Dark Money. Other recent award-winning films include A Plastic Ocean and Finding Kukan. Miriam has served numerous times as a lab advisor for the Sundance Institute Documentary Composers Lab and on film festival and awards juries, including Sundance, Ashland, Bend, AFI, Independent Spirit Awards, and IDA Awards. She is also a longtime board member of the Society of Composers and Lyricists. Miriam has co-produced two Grammy-nominated live jazz albums on Polygram Verve with artist Joe Williams and albums for Nina Simone, Shirley Horn, and Marlena Shaw, as well as independently released albums of her own songs and soundtracks. In 2014, Miriam traveled as a film expert to Malaysia, and in 2017, 
to Tbilisi, Georgia for the American Film Showcase, a cultural exchange program sponsored by the U.S. State Department and USC. She recently completed a composer in residence at Columbia College of the Arts, Chicago. Please welcome my guest today, Miriam <laughs> Cutler. Welcome, Hello. Miriam. <laughs> I'm Hi exhausted there. after hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of credits and a lot of information. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it sure is. And, and you know, the, the beauty is we haven't even scratched the surface of, of what you've done, at which we've well, got a whole hour to talk about. So first okay. of all, thank you for making the time. Uh, oh, sure. You're still in Chicago, is that correct? No, no, I got back last week. Oh, you're back home. Great. Welcome yeah. home. Thank you. So um, let's let's start. My first statement is that you have scored over 100 films and television programs. You've written songs for film and TV, created music for circus and theater projects, produced and recorded albums, and performed live in many bands and <laughs> venues. Yes. C- congratulations on not allowing yourself to be typecast. <laughs> It'd be hard. Yes, it would be very right. hard. <laughs> Was was that a conscious? Has that been a conscious choice for you? Um, I don't think I could help it. You know, I <laughs> feel like um, I sort of am who I am, and my interests are diverse. I mean, I basically started playing in ethnic bands. You know, I was a folk mm-hmm. dancer, and I just loved Balkan music and Israeli music and Greek music, and I played clarinet. So I started playing in those kind of bands. That was actually my first performances. And so um, I just have always followed my interest, and they just continue to keep me moving all over the place, as you can tell. Yeah, and I've been, we've been friends for a long time, full disclosure. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's part of the reason that I've been looking forward to having you on the show, because We've been following each other's careers since since 1981. Yeah, the early yeah, 80s yeah. when we first met. Um, you're one of the first uh, artists and musicians that I met when I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, it's been uh, a blast and totally entertaining to watch your career unfold. <laughs> you were Black just guys. mentioning. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah. You 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 be you are a clarinet player, but you began your music studies on piano before moving to the clarinet. And I'm wondering what drew you to the clarinet as a as your instrument. <laughs> well, you know, like a lot of children who are musical, I didn't. I just was interested in all instruments. But my parents offered me piano lessons first, so I took those. And then as soon as you know, then I wanted to play the cello. In those days, we had music education in elementary school. So you as sure soon did. as I was. Oh yeah, it was terrific, and so and physical fourth, education. Yeah, and physical education. So um, as soon as I hit the fourth grade, I wanted to play the cello, but my parents t- told me I couldn't. Um, then I went to the fifth grade, and it was time for the concert band, and so I said I want to play the trumpet, which my brother played, and my parents said, "Oh no, that's a boy's instrument," you know. And so uh, my uncle George had a clarinet in the attic, and that's how I ended <laughs> up playing clarinet, basically. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it was so much fun, you know, when you're a little kid and I always tell parents, you know, don't ever stop your kids from, if they're interested, let them touch and play and and all kinds of instruments because, you know, especially like now I'm a composer and it's because I played so many instruments when I was young, you know, I had this enthusiasm and I understood sort of basically the sound and, and the possibilities of instruments. So it all really feeds into my, my, uh, interest in composing and a lot of times parents put these provisos on their children. Oh, you have to practice, you know, you have to get good at this. You have to perform and do these concerts. And, you know, really just if children are interested, let them let them play in the sandbox. Beautiful choice of words. And I totally agree with you. Did did you learn to play other woodwind instruments as well? Or, or did you go <laughs> from clarinet and well, to clarinet, directly I, to other instruments? Well, I played clarinet you know, for a long time, I was in the marching band in in high school. And Mm -hmm. then of course, as soon as I became a teenager, I wanted to play the guitar because Joni Mitchell played the guitar, you know, and all these Mm -hmm. other wonderful Bonnie Raitt. And so I picked up the guitar and, and, you know, I, I really just was the kind of, I think a lot of people that are very musical, you can pick up a lot of instruments and do something with them. Whether you get good on them or not is up to how hard you want to work at it. But um, I always could sort of do that. And so and that continued, you know, I was a clarinet. I, I primarily performed on piano and clarinet. Mm-hmm. And then um, 
And then when I, and, and a little bit of guitar too, you know, whatever I needed to do. But then when I, at a certain point, when I met uh, Danny Elfman in the, in the seventies and mm-hmm. I was invited to come to a rehearsal and I came to the rehearsal and they just put a, a tenor sax in my hand and said, can you play this? <laughs> And I went, oh, well, let me see. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like that, you know, and then I right. learned what I needed to learn to play in that band. So, Right. And, and we'll, we will talk a, a little bit more about uh, the early days of Oingo Boingo and you being in, in that group. Um, but I, I do know that one of the things that, um, that Danny felt um, attracted to in you is your willingness and openness just to try anything, you know, and you would, like you said, you pick <laughs> so up a tenor. Much. And say, yeah, let's find out. I, well, <laughs> I think I can play at, it. <laughs> at that first rehearsal, you know, they, they had their ba- their ballophones there and they had their yeah. gamel on there. And we just went from thing to thing. And I was just super happy. And, and right. also, um, Steve Bartek, uh, he and I went to college together. I met him when mm-hmm. I was 17. We were in the same uh, dorm. And right. we actually played in these ethnic or eth- ethnic groups uh, at UCLA together. So that's mm-hmm. where we first became friends. And, you know... It was so fun running into him years later in the sure. Bongo. I think that's probably one of the reasons they liked me. Hmm. I, yeah, I can see why. Uh, did you, didn't you tour with the circus as well early on in your career? Yeah, um, actually. So um, I've always been interested in street theater, guerrilla theater, and that's really where my original performing, I had a, I was in a um, all woman feminist band called Alice Stone, and it was very guerrilla theater. You know, we did really goofy songs that I wrote and and political songs and ironic songs and things like that. And so my interest in in theater and I was always kind of a fan of of kind of European style circus. And then a friend of mine from high school called one day and it turned out he had studied theater and stuff. And he ended up road managing for this little circus in St. Louis and they needed somebody to write music. So he contacted me and, and I met with the producer who, by the way, so it was really funny. So they they came, they lived in St. Louis, but they were in L.A. because this producer had this elephant named Flora who became the mm. elephant in the Pee Wee Herman, uh, the very first Pee Wee Herman film, which right. was, um, what was Big it called? I forget. Yeah, Pee Wee. Uh, it was the second one. So, uh, right. I, so uh, that was another funny tie-in because Danny and Steve ended up scoring that film. But um, anyway, so it was really funny. I met with him. He came and saw my swing band at Vine Street, and he just liked the band, and he hired me to write the music. He didn't even listen to any of my music. He just liked me. And so I, that started a very, very long association. I, I started being the resident composer in 1980, what was it, 1988, I think. And then that was what led to One Lucky Elephant, because it was about the elephant in the circus. Right. So it's a very long association and I, I still contribute music to the circus. So talking about the, the 1970s in Los Angeles, you, there were street theater actors, oh, yeah. acrobats, musicians, clowns, definitely activists collaborating, finding oh, yeah. new ways to enlighten and entertain. The women's movement was really strong. The anti-war protesters were strong. Justice workers were taking on civil rights issues Political theater was was really an important part of our culture. Yeah. Did, did growing up in the epicenter of this very creative community give you the feeling that you could achieve anything that you could possibly imagine and, and even make a living <laughs> as an artist? No, not at all. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of fun. It contributed to my growth creatively and my sense of adventure. Because, you know, actually, after being a performer, I had different bands. You know, I was in the Oingo Boingo, and I was in Alice Stone. And then I ended up having another band of my own and doing my own songs. And I couldn't make a living. And so I basically decided to to give up. And I got a job at a singing telegram company, which was hilarious. Mm-hmm. Because I ended up, I started out selling singing telegrams on the phone. Like, the, people would call, and I would sing the songs. And then I started making up acts. And before I knew it, I had my own division and I was making up like these, you know, Tarzan and the eight band and stripping (laughs) meter maids and all kinds of really fun stuff. And in those days, it sort of merged into street theater. We had all these amazing performers. And so I was more on the side of writing and producing and selling and not performing. And, And it was incredible. So that was the first time I ever was able to monetize my talent, really you know, in a, in a way to make a living. And so, um, it was really fun. I did it for several years 
And then, of course, that led to my swing band, which I put together with this guy, Richard Green, for the Vine Street Bar and Grill to promote swing Richard Street. Green's. Yeah, but, but it right. started off to promote this. this uh, he had a, um, a script for a, a 30s, 80s musical, and um, I was helping him write the script. And then we ended up putting together a band at, for Vine Street to kind of work the script and promote the script. It, mm-hmm. it was all that was how it all started. Except it turns out I'm not really much of an actor. I'm really a musician, and so it was kind of weird for me to play another character. Right. But that's how the band started. I got Stan Aroff, who was in one of the earlier versions of the Oingo Boingo. That's how I knew him, and we put together this swing band. It was really fun. Yeah. And Vine Street Bar and Grill, for those who don't know, was a very prestigious jazz club in Hollywood, in well, Los it Angeles. At first, when we first started, it was just a little Italian restaurant. And he was looking Great. for ways to promote it. And right. so Richard and I went in and Richard pitched this idea that we would put together this fake 30s, 80s nightclub and put a band together. And we did it. And it was very successful. Um, it really put the place on the map. And then I ended up inheriting the gig and did it for four nights a week for like two years. At, at That's the house band, right? Yeah. And I had a lot of great players come through and... Um, and then at some point I said, Ron, that Ron was the owner, Ron Berenstein. And, and I, I said, Ron, Ron. Yeah. oh yeah, he was a great character. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I was getting bored and I thought we were kind of, dra- you know, the audiences were not as strong as they had been. And I said, why don't we book some other people? And he goes, he didn't know anything about music, nothing. And so he hmm. just said, well, okay, let's do it. Why don't you go book them? <laughs> you know? So the first person I I tried to book was Etta James because a friend of mine in Seattle had booked her for some for some small gigs up there and I got her number and called her up and, uh, and we got her in there and she started playing Monday nights. And then the second person I booked was Mose Allison. Um, and from there it just right. took off. I mean, it became this incredible nightclub, you know, with just, we had, I mean, every, every jazz artist that I ever admired, I was able to book because Ron, he didn't know anything about music. So he, he let me just make the rep, you know, I just, cast the place and then he would and, do all the business stuff you know and let me name a few other artists that that you ended up booking george shearing joe williams betty carter carmen <laughs> mccray yeah. john hendrix linda hopkins <laughs> johnny otis phil woods earth the kit big, big joe, joe turner, turner. <laughs> right big joe anita o'day annie ross paquito de rivera astro oh, gilberto yeah. billy Eckstein, alan broadbent nina simone phil shirley Wood. horn marlena yeah. shaw and yeah. yeah, and I that was one of the places that I I used to play it with my band as well, and it was such a it turned into a really beautiful venue. We're oh we're God, heading into so our our first commercial break, um, and when we come back, I want to talk about how that led to you uh, producing a couple of Grammy nominated records. So um, I'm with Miriam Cutler, and uh, we are talking about life as a film composer and an artist, and and talking about life in general. So please stick around and we'll be right back. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. 
I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Uh, this is John Shaw, bagpipe player, and you're listening to Making It with Terry Wolf. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. You're listening to my guest, Miriam Cutler, uh, musician, multi-instrumentalist, composer, friend. And uh, that's, uh, what was that piece of music from, Miriam? Do you remember? Yeah, it was the end credits for a documentary I did, I did called Stolen Childhoods. And that was the great Vicki Randall singing. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Some of the great players, you know, Ira Ingber, Carl C. Love, some just amazing players. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, it was a five minute end credit, so they really let me just go to town. <laughs> nice. That's fun yeah, when you get fun. to do that. Yeah, it was fun. Vicky was amazing. <clears throat> yeah, she really is talented. Mm-hmm. Um, she's going to be on the show uh, sometime soon, also. We're, we're pinning down a date for her. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So when when you were working, performing and booking Vine Street Bar and Grill, you also ended up co-producing two Grammy-nominated live jazz albums on Polygram, Verve, for Joe Williams. And you also recorded, produced um, albums with Nina Simone, Shirley Horn, Marlena Shaw. My question to you is, what are some of the similarities and differences between the life of a record producer compared to the more isolated life of a film composer? <laughs> Well, first of all, I should say I co-produced those with David Kreisberg. Um, mm-hmm. and, and one of the most interesting things about doing those albums where we were one of the pioneers of um, digital recording. We, we mm-hmm. actually, because we were right near Capitol Records, they, actually, they worked out some kind of a deal where we took these huge video recorders, right? And they, they mm-hmm. rolled two of them into the back, back room at Vine Street. And David was the engineer. And then after we recorded several nights of performances, I mean, it was so different in those days when it wasn't, when it wasn't, you know, there was, it wasn't like today where you have a computer and you can just edit on the computer. It was all very, very primitive. And so Mm -hmm. I would take these, take video, take cassettes of, uh, you know, just regular cassettes. I would, of of the recordings and I would just listen to them and try to pick editing points. Then I would go to the editing suite where we had to sit there with two big giant video machines. I think they were Hmm. two inch and, um, and an engineer and he had a little synchronizer that was really primitive and you had to like start one machine and then you had, you had to program in all the, all the edit points and they were very, you know, there was no way to be completely accurate because, it, right. you know, you just had to keep doing it till they got it right, but you had to get to speed. I mean, it was so crazy, but it was a great experience because that's how I kind of cut my teeth on digital, digital, uh, technology. <laughs> right. It, which is where, where, where we all live now with, yeah, with really got having our, that. yeah. And you know, we've all, 
most of us have composers and artists have become um, quite proficient engineers as well because we all have studios. You have to. Yeah. Yeah, you do. I mean, I sort of, I, one of the things that's kind of fun about, I mean, I'm a little older and I, I basically have ridden the technological changes. Like I have my career basically because of the technology. Like when I first started, you know, there was no synchronization, you know, not in a home studio and in the home studio, it was all analog, you know, and you would start the video machine and run over and start the tape machine and try to make them look like they were about where they should be you know, when you're showing the director and then right. also following that, you know, all the way through the analog, then to the digital where now everything's computerized. So it made it very possible to have a film composing career, you know, and work from my home, which in the beginning you'd have to go to a studio and pay for studio time. And all of that was very expensive. So that's just a little side story. You know, it's, it's really right. interesting, the trajectory, how it all worked. But but I just want to give my perspective of that, having known you for so many years, as long as it's been possible to have home recording equipment, you've had it. Yes. You have had you have had some variation of it. And there, I, you know, I, so I, I have started. memories of coming to your apartment with my guitar and recording guitar parts for you. Oh, yeah. Years uh, ago. Four track cassette. That's right. I, and we would do these really elaborate demos, you know. Oh, absolutely. With like and, rhythm section drums. Yeah. You know, you just bounce, 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 and then right. I'd have backup vocals, and you know, it was just insane when I think right. about so, it now. But <laughs> so you 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 have always um, you know embraced technology and and been curious and open yeah. to to well, learning about that part of it. The thing about it is, I basically was not a technical person whatsoever. I literally <laughs> nor can't I. Follow, <laughs> yeah, I can't follow a signal path, you know, to hook up a stereo. But my desire was burning, you know, and this technology made it possible for me to. I, I'd always had all these musical ideas, and now within reach, the technology existed for me to be able to actually develop these ideas. And so it's it's always motivated. I've been very motivated, even though it's been difficult for me. To, to master the technological stuff. And I still struggle with some of it, but, but, you know, I try to keep up with the latest technologies because they make more wonderful things possible, you know? So we have to just do it. Right. <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. We do. And, and what do you have a particular favorite um, software program that you use for a recording? Yeah, I use, I use digital performer and I always oh, so do I. Me too. Yeah, I, start, I started on a Commodore computer, and then as soon as I switched to the little Mac Classic, I got right. a performer. And I, I, I would be loath to change DAWs at this point in my life. It's just too hard. They're too complicated. They are. And, Unfortunately, yeah. there's no need anymore. But yeah. that's so – yeah, I'm so happy to hear that because I've been a loyal user of, of Digital Performer or Performer since we had our first Macs, you know, when they first came out. And oh yeah. Well, I think perf- I think Digital Performer is an is an exceptional composer tool. And you know, it has had its issues over the years, sure. but they they just keep making it better and better and better and more things are possible and and so they've really stuck with it and and I I'm very glad they did cuz a lot of technologies have gone away. Right. And um they've really stayed and continued to develop it. So I'm I'm very glad about that. But I'll get back to your original question which was the what's different about producing yes it's actually interesting because um it's not that different for me the only real difference is that i'm collaborating with um you know a filmmaker and that's a very deep and complex relationship but as far as the actual music part of it you know i've always had these these ideas i've always written these ideas i've always developed them in my studio i've always produced them and i continue to produce my scores the same way i would produce a record which is a little different than other people I know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I do a lot of overdubbing in my studio, working one-on-one with musicians. And, um, you know, it's just the way I came up. I started on records. And so I've always done music that way because I like to have that, that collaboration with the, with the musicians as well. And, you know, I get ideas as soon as I start hearing music and hearing what they play, my brain starts exploding with ideas. And so Mm -hmm. it's nice to have that, you know, I always, the reason I always wanted my own home studio was so that I could have a relaxed environment and not be, you know, always counting the tick tock of the clock. Right. And, um, so, you know, it is a labor intensive way to work, but uh, that's how I get the results I get. It's my process. So I just try not to complain about it. <laughs> it's, you know, that's, 
<clears throat> I'm glad you're talking about your your process because that's a lot about what this show is um, features and focuses on. And and I'm always curious because there's so many similarities between the way artists work, and then there's always something uniquely um, divinely unique to each artist that I speak with about what works for them. But I, I understand the idea of having a studio and not feeling the pressure of being on a clock. You still are on a deadline, but and you can, clock, I'm paying the musicians by the hour, but that's but right. It's a lot different being in my studio uh, and then also having access to the material and, and working with it in my own time, in my own way. Um, right. And yeah, oh, I was going to say, I can't remember what I was going to say, but um, it really is fantastic having your own workspace. And over the years, as I've gotten older and had a little more money to spend on my studio, I've been able to make it even more and more, you know, comfortable and comfortable, right? aesthetically pleasing and light, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, you know, everybody, you know, one of the things that I always find fascinating is if you go to different people's studios and observe how they've set up their their equipment, their software, the things they use, the tools they use, it's very interesting. You get an, an insight into their process. And it's what I love about this work is that everybody really has their own way of doing it. And um, it's fascinating. Hmm. Sometimes I learn something, you know, like you, I've been in performer my whole adult life right? Digital performer. But yes. we used to have these hangouts. I, a bunch of us would get together and just talk about stuff. And I was, I couldn't believe all the stuff I didn't know. You know, there's just more and more, it's just so deep. And so that means it's very important to have community, other composers, right. filmmakers, musicians, but with co other composers and musicians, when, when you have that community, when, if you run into some difficult issues technologically, you know, you have somebody to call that can walk you through it or give you an idea or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a yes. real collaborative career path. And I, I always uh, try to advise young upcoming composers to keep developing that sense of community. And, you know, it's, it's like, we really can support and nurture each other. It's not really, I mean, it, there are people that approach it in a competitive way and we do compete for similar jobs, but right. we also are a community that really helps each other. I'm glad to hear you say that because, you know, part of being a composer uh, is it's a very uh, isolating um, yeah. experience. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, the fact that you are so deeply immersed in the, the composing community and artist community and is a beautiful balance, you know, and, yeah. and one that I think it's important for everyone to have. I mean, the nature of becoming an accomplished musician is to isolate yourself in a room with an instrument. And, yeah. uh, you know, but oftentimes the payoff, the payoff is when you get to go play with other great musicians and then, then right. It's the, 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 the payoff, payoff is the collaboration. Yeah. And it's the same thing in my work, yeah. you know, or, or in, in film composing, my, I collaborate with the filmmakers. I collaborate with the musicians. It's like a big jam session. I, in fact, I'm starting <laughs> to realize my entire approach to life is like a jam session. You know, <laughs> you just go into it feeling very open and flexible and pay attention and respond right. to what happens. And, and that's how the best music happens. Absolutely. Even, even when it's all written out, still there's room for that, you know? Yes. So speaking of owning your own recording studio and all of the wonderful gear that you use, my favorite piece of gear in your studio is your dad's guitar. I love, <laughs> I love that you have your dad's guitar and you play it and record it all the time. Tell me about that special instrument. Well, when I was a kid, you know, I, I come from a musical family and um, it was never considered something for a profession. In mm -hmm. fact, my father really discouraged, my brother was a wonderful trumpet player and my dad totally discouraged him. You know, he used to be in bands and stuff when he was a teenager and then he got him into the Navy and business and all that. But uh, I thought it was a kind of a loss for him. But um, anyway, I think that um, my, da my dad had this Martin guitar that he bought in the 50s, I guess. And so I grew up with it. And when I was like 12 years old, I used to carry it around to my friend's house, and, you know, to play it. This really beautiful, valuable guitar, which I had no idea it was valuable. Right. And so I had it all through junior high, high school, college, and I schlepped it everywhere. And, and now it lives in my studio. And I, I don't play it very well anymore. But um, I use it for inspiration. And, and that brings up another thing, which is that, you know, it's really easy to get all caught up in all this technology and all the, um, you mm -hmm. know, great samples that are out there. But in the last few years, I've really 
kind of collected some more instruments, you know, uh, uh, ukulele and mandolin mm -hmm. and things I don't really play, you know. I have them all laid out around the studio and and I pick them up periodically and just mess with them and and it, and it actually I've I've actually written some of my scores that way, you know, getting away from the keyboard and really kind of thinking more guitaristically or whatever and right. so it's it's i think it's really important to touch instruments and have them around and just have them on your body when you play them the vibration you can feel it on your body and all these things the overtones and and so i think it's really for me i find it very inspiring just to have them around even though i can't play them very well but i get a lot of ideas just from touching them and making noise absolutely on them. i want to read a quote of yours i think <laughs> <laughs> I think part of my job as a composer is to discover the universal aspects of a story and connect those two emotions that can be expressed musically to engage the audience in a personal way. Can you elaborate on that? Um, my doorbell rang just as you were oh. reading it. I'm sorry. It's I'm okay. going to ignore it, but go ahead. can you read it one more time? Absolutely. This is something that I read in an interview of yours. Wow. I think, I think part of my job as a composer is to discover the universal aspects of a story and connect those two emotions that can be expressed musically to engage the audience in a personal way. Oh, of course. Well, that really uh, speaks to musical themes and developing those themes and articulating and calibrating very carefully the emotional uh, tone, especially in documentary films, which are often about very important subjects, very personal things. People take great risks uh, to, ex you know, to expose themselves in certain mm -hmm. ways, and filmmakers take great risks. And so I take it very seriously. I feel a very big responsibility. And therefore, I want the music always to be utterly honest, non-gimmicky, you know, um, really show deep understanding and respect for what's being communicated and support it in the best ways possible. So working with the director, we figure out what exactly we're trying to do. And then my job is to find the same, you know, music is like a universal emotional language. When you try to articulate about it in words, um, it's sometimes difficult, but mm -hmm. when you put, when you put music to picture, uh, it changes the meaning of, of the footage. And so it's very important that the footage that I understand what the meaning is, you know, or what it's supposed to be. And, and what better way to organize emotional feelings than through themes? I mean, themes are very powerful emotionally. And so you have a strong theme with a harmonic development and a good melody, and then you do variations of those, you know, and you, you in, incorporate all these important musical um, tools um, to be, to, to, to use the music in the most powerful way or in the most successful way. Um, and so, yeah, the universal story, I mean, musical themes touch the same, the same thing in a human heart, right? Mm, you have yes. these, these universal themes in the film and you have universal themes emotionally that, uh, that are connected to those ideas. And so, uh, I music... need to cut you off. We're, we're heading into our next break. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, don't apologize. And um, thank you for articulating that. We will be right back with composer Miriam Kappa. Please stick around. Phil Perry. Stay tuned for another portion of Making It. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on InterTalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing. And it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. Do you know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. 
Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jonathan Butler, and you're listening to Making It. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. I'm here with my guest, Miriam Cutler. Miriam, I wanted to ask you about your singing because you've, you know, you're also a singer. And uh, do you have formal vocal training? That's my question for you. (laughs) No. (laughs) No, if I did, I I could probably still be singing. But uh, sadly, when you don't use it, it kind of goes away. And I spent too many hours at the computer, I think. (laughs) So, but you've you've always had this really... uh, it, always, as long as I've known you, which has been a long time, you've had this beautiful sense of of confidence and and comfort. You know, looking back at some of your early performance videos, it just seems like you've always been comfortable on stage as an artist and as a player and as a singer. Is that just natural confidence? No. Um, well, I mean, what's really interesting is when I was young, I was very insecure and very shy, and it never even occurred to me to perform. You know, Mm -hmm. I used to sing with my guitar in a small circle with friends. You know, it it was music was really for me much more helped me get through the day than thinking of it as a performance or a profession. And so over the years, when I started performing my first band, Alice Stone, I used to hide under a hat and stand in the back. Mm -hmm. And then we lost our front person and everybody looked at me because I was a singer So I started singing, and what I discovered was that the person I could be on stage was who I actually wanted to be. Uh, And and it it was really interesting. I did it for like 20 years, maybe more. And I got really comfortable and good at it, way more comfortable on stage than off with with people. And then one day, it finally became who I was, and I didn't feel the need to perform anymore. I just was done with it. (laughs) So I kind of used it. It was my way of, it was like therapy or something, you know, it was my way of growing myself to be the person that I actually could be instead of this, you know, insecure blob. That's great. um, Yeah. So I think, you know, it served its purpose and I, I I very, you know, in the last 20 years I've been just composing, I really never missed it at all until very recently when I kind of wish I could play with other people again. Mm -hmm. But I'd have to practice and put a lot of energy into that in order to be right. able to do it. So mm-hmm. I never get around to it. <laughs> Once in a while, actually, even Perla Batala, uh, we were getting together and singing a little bit. She was helping mm-hmm. me a little bit. Nice. It was fun. Yeah. So you've been socially and politically active throughout your life. Why is that important to you? Oh, 
because I'm a human being with a heart. <laughs> I mean, I, I, <laughs> yes. I have always been like, I can see the potential of everything. It's like my fa- one of my favorite l- lines is something Lily Tomlin said. She, she says, uh, life is perverse. It could be wonderful, but it won't. <laughs> and, um, and I always see how, Oh my God, this could be incredible. And why can't we just make that happen? Like justice and, you know, everybody having enough to eat. Why can't people be happy? Why does there have to be somebody slave driving? You know, it's, it's kind of like we all define our own realities. And so why can't the people with the happy, pleasant reality definitions be in charge? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, when I see things that seem like they need to be changed to, to, to improve something, I want to be part of that. And one of the reasons I've focused on documentaries is because I did, I was solvent. I was working and making a living, scoring lots of different kinds of things, low budget horror movies and corporate videos and stuff like that. And I just felt like, what's my life about it? It didn't Mm -hmm. have any meaning to me. Like some people are just happy if they can write music. But for me, I want to write music for something that's bigger than me, that matters. And Mm -hmm. that is thrilling. And that's why I do documentaries, because they really resonate with me. And I share values with the filmmakers. And I want to be part of the world they're trying to be in, you know. So I do, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been a very, very happy discovery. When I discovered documentary film is when I really got happier. You you teach in addition to composing. You've been carving out some time to teach master classes and clinics, and just came back from Chicago teaching one. And what specifically do you cover in your classes? It's kind of interesting. Um, I am not an academic teacher. I didn't ever study music that way. It actually doesn't work for me to study music that way, even though I tried. I'm just per, a kind of a natural musician who learns by listening and paying attention and being driven by my interest in something. Um, and so the things that, you know, I really focus on storytelling, musical storytelling. I've mm-hmm. come up with this idea of kind of that I've sort of borrowed from filmmakers a uh, music story arc and how does that coincide and support a story arc? And um, I try to get composers to, uh, you know, up and coming people that are that are taking a class from me. I, I try to share with them how I see story, how I see music being used in story to support the vision of the filmmaker. And it really focuses a lot more on how you use the tools of musical composition to to create natural, organic, um, um, successful scores. You know what I mean? And so Mm -hmm. a lot of times composers, what I find with music people and composers, they tend to come to this, to the situation of a film with music as their focus. And, and, um, I actually have learned so much from my filmmakers and I actually teach filmmakers how to work with a composer. That's one of my favorite things because Mm -hmm. a lot of it boils down to them understanding how to direct a composer successfully, right? Right. how to get the most out of having this potential for this unique, amazing, original score for their film that, that does what exactly they want it to do instead of settling for things that kind of work. So, um, you know, that, that's my focus is really musical storytelling and how do we, and then from that, everything else comes because like in my class in Chicago, um, we were working on, you know, scoring something and then we were discussing how successful it is and talking about all these ideas about musical storytelling. And, but it would also lead to who we, who each person is as an artist. How do you find your voice as a, as a composer? Um, how do you, how do you support and nourish and nurture the things that are unique about you and your music, you know, and how do you, um, blend that into someone else's project? How do you successfully collaborate? So the collaboration goes two ways, you know, from the Mm -hmm. filmmaker to the composer and the composer to the filmmaker. So I, I, I love bringing them in together and working with them together. That's one Mm -hmm. of the things we do at the Sundance lab. Um, and so getting them comfortable because it, Sometimes they be in the beginning, they come from such different worlds. Like right. a lot of documentary filmmakers are very content driven and some of them are not necessarily as interested in craft even, or the possibilities of filmmaking. And even if they are, they don't understand how to get more from their composer. So it really is exciting when those light bulbs start going off, you know, that people are able to begin to see how to harness the power of music and make it work for their particular project. 
And then the composers are happier too, you know. Well, right, because you're teaching them to have how to have a relationship with each other. Yeah, and also how to put the music in service of the film and the sure, story right. and yes. serve its function, you know. I want to ask you a couple of questions that are a little bit more technical, but I but I don't want in depth answers because I want to get back to some other more personal things. But so okay. uh, so just short answers. But uh, in any one of these, we could spend an hour talking about. Uh, how do you educate your clients to show them that you're not limited to composing in a particular sound or style? Oh well, um, gosh, I guess I you know I show them or play them things or open their mind, you know, by giving them, like, if we're working together, I might, you know, I, I try to have a discussion with them about the creative process and about the possibilities and how I'm going to present them with some ideas and that will help us narrow down our direction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with that, um, I'm able to introduce some ideas and I think it's very important to, to communicate often and thoroughly with directors so that they never feel threatened or that they have to accept something that's overwhelming or, Hey, you know, put this in, see what it does for you. Try to get used to it. Spend a little time right. with it. You know, I try mm -hmm. to gently nudge them if I have certain ideas, but not everyone wants my opinion. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. they just want to give me my directions and then I, they want me to do it. And that's fine too. I, I'm happy either way, as long as, but my goal is to make both of us happy. I would never right. turn in music that I don't think is good you know, or that hurts their film, you know. Right. And your focus is on serving the story. Yeah. In the best way that I can. You know? Right. Uh, let's talk about creating and presenting a realistic recording budget when you're asked to compose original music <laughs> for a documentary without yeah. giving prices and fees. Do you recommend beginning your negotiation by asking the film producer what their budget range is, or do you give them an estimate based on the amount of music you're being asked to record and the number of musicians you're probably going to need to hire? Well, you or do know, you just have a set fee? Well, it's always I have in my mind a bottom line, right? Because I have enough experience to know what I can do with X amount of dollars, and mm -hmm. I also have in my mind a, a boundary uh, that I won't cross. You know, like right. for instance, if they are so cheap that they can't afford any players, then I'll suggest they call someone else because I'm right. very into live musicians. So I right. think you can narrow it down that way. Um, I also have found very helpful. I have what I, I have my own little document that when someone calls me up and it sounds like we're interested in each other, I say, let me send you my document. And in it, I explain my process. I explain what the money buys. I explain mm -hmm. when it gets more expensive and how they can control it. So like I say, you know, if we're, if we're using strings, that usually means it's going to cost a little more and here's mm -hmm. what that pays for. And here's how that breaks down, you know, because when you first are working on something before it, they always want to get a price before you even know what you're going to write. And right. so, you know, I find that I like to leave doors open. So I give mm -hmm. them a bottom line and then I tell them the possibilities and then we can discuss it as we get going. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and that has really helped over the years. Like instead of having to start from scratch with every single person I talk to, I right. just send them my document and it right. lays out for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a template. It lays out how I work and what the money pays for. And I think when I got to a certain place in my career where I was known a bit more, it was easier to use that. But I, I don't mm -hmm. think it's a bad idea to have something like that, even for a, a beginner, because mm -hmm. they have no idea. They walk in and they see a computer and they think you push a button and it magically is a score. Sure. Mean, they have no idea how labor intensive it is, even if you don't work with musicians. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot of work to, to create a score and produce it, even if you're doing nitty. So, um, right. you know, I try to educate them all along the way. That's one of the things I started doing early on. And, and I'm lucky because documentary filmmakers are kind of coming from a different place often. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're already coming from a place where we share values. They care about people. <laughs> they care about, you know, how they treat people. They care about right. ethical issues. And that's one of the reasons I like working in that community. Mm -hmm. Does the deadline affect the price? Um, I actually am at the point where I won't take a film if I don't have the, enough time. Enough time. Got it. Because I don't want to, I did that when I was young and I don't really want to sure. do that anymore. And I think it mm -hmm. really, you know, there are, you know, when you're young and, you know, you can prove you can stay up for four nights sure. in a row right. to get it done. And, and that's okay. I think there's a certain amount of that you have to do to get going. But um, I think as soon as, you know, I, I just think that the more I've learned about, coming from a place of self-respect, the more respect mm -hmm. I've gotten from other people. 
Absolutely. And it seems to work like that. Like if you mm-hmm. put out that you'll do anything for a thousand bucks, that's what you'll get. That's right. <laughs> well, that, that leads to my final question. We, we've got about three minutes left of our oh. conversation. Okay. And I, my final question of, of the day that I ask all of my guests is at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Um, what would I tell my younger self? Well, I sort of was trying to keep the faith the whole time, you know, cause you really wonder, I think that we all wonder, is this ever going to work out? Am I ever mm-hmm. going to get anywhere? Am I going to wake up in, at, at 60 and look back and go, Oh God, what did I do with my life? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, so I kept the faith and actually I think for, for some of us, um, there's no other choice. Like you're so driven to do this that, you know, and, and so I always recommend to people, like I would have said to myself, what I say to other young people, know who you are, understand what works for you, what makes you happy, what satisfies you and don't ignore those things. Try to build a career around those things. And that, and once I started doing that, I got much happier. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking at another quote, of yours and one of the Dalai Lamas <laughs> that, uh, and I want to read them both okay. um, because I think they're, they're important. Uh, your quote uh, is, I think women composers face the same kind of challenges that women directors, cinematographers, and others in the traditionally male dominated film professions are dealing with. Our percentages are woefully low in the mainstream Hollywood industry, but I think this is merely a reflection of what's going on in the greater society. The Dalai Lama quote, the world will be saved by Western women. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah. And uh, those go beautifully <laughs> hand in hand. Um, we've got, we've got about another minute. Speak to being a woman in, in the entertainment industry. Well, I think I know I can speak for myself in saying that I always intuitively knew without really articulating it in my mind that I had to constantly prove myself to be taken seriously. Yeah, I had to be twice as good, twice as hardworking, you know, twice as badass. And I think that um, most women that enter a field that's mostly men understand that without being told, you know, without even maybe even consciously thinking about it. Now we've got statistical information to back us up. And it just so happens that what's going on in the greater industry, the, the Hollywood, is that they're being called to task, you know, regarding the woefully low percentages of women in power positions in terms of Mm -hmm. creative roles and stuff. So, um, and I have to say that women composers are the lowest of the low of those statistics in terms of how many are working on theatrically released films. So, Mm -hmm. um, a couple years ago, Laura Cartman, Lolita Ritmanis and Doreen Ringer Ross and I kind of launched this idea for the Alliance for Women Film Composers to kind of help uh, younger women. Because what we're finding is younger women are truly interested in this career. They're coming mm-hmm. out they're you know, they're coming out of the, of the schools and stuff in large numbers, but they're not penetrating through the gatekeepers. Where and can so, we have 20 seconds left? Where can people find out about the Alliance of, of Women Composers and also find you? Uh, www.miriamcutler.com. And then www.theawfc.com. We're going to post all of those on the website as well. Yeah. And Uh, young women, come look us up. We have a directory online and we're here for you. Great. Thank you so much, Miriam Cutler. It's been a pleasure spending the hour with you. (laughs) Thank you. I hope it was meaningful. (laughs) Very much. See you all next week. of Making It with Terry Wolf. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be the music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on JackieScrew.com.
Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer you know what's all around you every waking moment of your life marketing you're choking on it i'm scott robertson and when it comes to strategic pr branding and marketing i've seen it all and actually i'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps join me each week on may the best brand win right here on inner talk radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 